Herzlich willkommen im Kulturkaufhaus, auch und besonders im Namen von Catherine Dussmann, die heute ja leider nicht hier sein kann, was ich persönlich sehr bedauere, denn zu dem Thema Why the Germans do it better, hätte sie vielleicht als Amerikanerin das eine oder andere zu beigetragen. Ich nehme an, sie hätte uns sehr viele Anekdoten aus den letzten Jahren zum Besten gegeben, aber jetzt müssen wir leider ohne zurechtkommen. Ich freue mich sehr, dass Sie hier sind und uns dieses schöne Buch heute Abend präsentieren werden. Herzlich willkommen, Herr Kampfner, herzlich willkommen, Herr Lenz. Ja, vielen herzlichen Dank. I switch to English. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rudiger Lenz. I'm the director of the Aspen Institute. And in these corona-stricken times, this is sort of a very special event, because for me, as well as for John, It's the first live uh, event in six months or more than six months since the total lockdown. Uh, it's something we have to celebrate. We'll do that afterwards with wine and some nibblings. And secondly, I think it's an extraordinary uh, event in, in, in two ways. First of all, a Brit writing about Germany in a very positive way is astounding in itself. Uh, we are normally not known to love each other uh, more than to mock each other. And so far, this is number one, which is strange, but it has an explanation in itself because he not only loves Germany, he knows Germany better than many Germans. He was a correspondent twice in Bonn, the Bonn Republic. Later on, he was in the last days of the GDR, saw the fall of the wall, uh, and uh, served as a British uh, a journalist for the Daily Telegraph. He was also in Moscow, one of our not so close neighbors and one of uh, the political problems we also have to discuss tonight. Uh, my very special thanks go to John Kampfner. Thank you, John, for joining us. It's a pleasure. You're a friend of Aspen, you're a friend of myself. Uh, I have been one of the many you have been interviewing during the last couple of years. Uh, and I think if I might sort of uh, sum it up, this book is a very thorough analysis, but it is more, it's anecdotal. It's amusing in some parts. Uh, it, it has a very interesting sort of view from the outside, but also sort of from the inside to Germany. And it shows our country in a way many Germans don't see it, in a very positive way. And that, that's why you choose the title. Uh, and uh, coming from London, being here in Berlin, which you sort of choose as your second city to maybe live in, It is interesting in these dire times where Brexit is looming around the corner that we are talking today about a Germany which many of us might not even have seen through its lens. And I'm very interested in knowing more about it and that's what we are doing tonight. Second thing, uh, a very gracious uh, thank you to Catherine who can't be with us tonight. She is uh, always a very gracious host for our book events here in the Kulturkaufhaus in Berlin. She can't see us at the moment, but now we will have it taped and hopefully she can watch it later on. So thank you, Catherine, for joining us later on and thank you as always for being a gracious hostess. And also I would like to say to our wider audience for our taped version, you will certainly be part of an enjoyable evening, which I will, I'm very sure will be entertaining as I hope and I'm sure it will also be enlightening. Um, let's just a couple of words about uh, the proceedings. First of all, we have a short reading from John, because I think most of you might not have the opportunity to read the book, or at least not even part of the book. So he would set the stage by three very small um, bits and pieces. We'll give you a glimpse into what he thinks is one of the reasons why Germany is special and also why he did write the book, which I think is also very important. So he will answer that question by reading, and then we'll uh, start an interview here on the stage for about 20 minutes, and then I will hand it over to you. You can unlift your mask and ask your questions, and we will, he will certainly try to answer it. So again, thank you very much, um, and let me share first my personal impression. I normally am not complimenting former colleagues and colleagues as journalists very much because I know that sometimes we are really a crazy bunch of people. Journalists are a very special breed. You know, I know. But I have to say this is the most comprehensive story I ever read about my own country. It's 75 years of history, which you sort of put a very special focus on and try to analyze it. 
And because of your many uh, personal acquaintances and meetings with people, so you feel sort of it, 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 uh, it shows also the sense of other people who are now part of that book. And so far I have to thank you because it also opened my eyes about my own country and that means a lot to me. Thank you John for joining us and now you read and then we start discussing it. Thank you. Thank you really, but um, I never listened to him. I'll just say a few words before I read. First of all, thank you hugely to, to Dusman for having this event um, and thank you to you. Um, because when we first met, which wasn't so long ago, um, it was almost immediately a meeting of minds, and that matters a huge amount to me of when I was planning to do some events in Germany and uh, whether they were going to be digital or physical, I immediately thought I would like to do it through the good auspices of Aspen um, because I value this relationship. I feel very exposed tonight because even though it's a small audience for obvious health reasons, um, it's a perfectly formed audience of ambassadors, generals, industrialists, all of whom know more about my country than I know, um, let alone about your own country. So I, I will do my best in spite of your flattery and your kind remarks um, to equip myself well and I must say, I mean, just a few words about the process. When I started talking to people um, at the beginning of only last year, this book was done in a year, in the course of 2019, I probably spent half the year here in Berlin and elsewhere in Germany. At the beginning, I would tell people, some of whom I knew from before and some of whom I met for the first time, the plan title and untertitel of the book. And every single person either laughed or shrieked. Das können Sie nicht schreiben. Das können Sie nicht sagen. Um, they were really shocked. And I had to do the annual lecture to the Goethe Institute in London. And the wonderful director there, Katharina, said, uh, could you please change the title of your lecture? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm afraid not, I won't. And then she said, but that's going to bring us problems. <laughs> and I said... It's the good institute approach. And I said, sorry, if you want me, that's going to be the title. And uh, anyway, now it is this extraordinary. And something has happened. And this, I think I've been very fortunate with this book because it seems to have struck a nerve. The publishers, and unfortunately you are among them, many people who have struggled to get hold of copies of this book. It's been an absolute um, logistical nightmare. Um, and we are now in the fifth print run um, in only three weeks, which is incredible, but they are struggling. Everybody blames COVID for all their problems and they say it's all because of COVID. Well, you know, who knows? But um, there's been an amazing shortage of the books which has produced a certain sort of cachet around the books, but hopefully um, that will be sorted. And most pleasingly to me, again, there was, I think, a reluctance among German publishers to publish the book at the beginning. I think now they have seen its success in the UK. They've all changed their minds, and um, I'm very pleased that next year I'll be publishing a, a slightly different, but basically similar book um, with Robot, um, which will be done, uh, and they have insisted that um, after today and various interviews I've done with Spiegel and with others that I can't do any more German media until the German book comes out next spring. But So that's the context of the book, and I think it does shine a light on the feelings of so many Britons um, about the, the tragedy that is going on in our own country, but also the juxtaposition of that tragedy with um, what is going on here in this country. Um, and when you get a chance to read it, I hope you will see that it is not uncritical of Germany. There are many, many criticisms um, and suggestions for how to make this country even better. So, how shall I begin? Okay. So, um, 
selected. Um, Always start with good. Selected three short extracts, um, and uh, the first one, which is the start of the first chapter, which is called "Rebuilding and Remembering the Pain of the po Post-War Years." <clears throat> Weimar is the city of Goethe and Schiller, of Bach and Liszt, of the Renaissance painter Cranach the Elder. It is where the woman of letters and salon queen Madame de Stael fell in love with the culture of Germany and where the ba Bauhaus art school had its beginnings. Outside my, my hotel, the number six bus takes you the short distance from Goethe Square to the Buchenwald concentration camp. You don't need to go far in Germany to be confronted by its terrible history. In Munich, it takes 20 minutes, actually, Somebody told me it takes 30, but I, when I did it, it was 20. It takes 20 minutes to travel from the, on the S-Bahn, uh, number two central station, to its end stop, Dachau. In Berlin, it's a little more complicated to reach Sachsenhausen by public transport, but the trip north of the city can be done in just over an hour. For the past half century, Germany has engaged in an act of atonement that has dominated all aspects of life with everything referenced back to the Nazi era. Germans' high state of moral alert, even after all these years, still dictates much of what they do. The historian Fritz Stern talks of the Germans' wish to believe in Hitler, quote, in their involuntary choice of Nazism. Stern spent his long career seeking to answer the question, why and how did the universal human potential for evil become an actuality in Germany. Or, as the British historian A.J.P. Taylor contended, writing in the closing months of the war, the history of the Germans is a history of extremes. It contains everything except moderation. And in the course of a thousand years, the Germans have experienced everything except normality. An entire phraseology has been built up around the need to remember. Vergangenheitsbewältigung, coming to terms with history, Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, processing history, Erinnerungskultur, culture of remembrance, and most controversially, collective schuld, collective guilt. German history, even pre-20th century, is seen through this lens. Unlike France or Britain, or many other countries around the world, there are no grand national day ceremonies, although the recently inaugurated Day of German Unity on the 3rd of October is now tentatively being marked. Those who died in military service to their country are not afforded honours. The only parades are local folkloric or cultural ones. There is little pageantry, which could account for Germans' obsession with royalty and celebrity elsewhere. Which other country would build a monument to its own shame and right next to its two most famous landmarks? The memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe sits close to the Brandenburg Gate and the Reichstag in the, height of, in the heart of Berlin, containing 2,711 rectangular concrete slabs, each resembling a coffin. It was inaugurated in 2005. School groups descend on it from all parts of the country, children warned to be quiet at all times. To watch their faces as they leave is instructive. Some historians and architects have criticised it as too abstract cold even. I see it as chilling and in the appropriate sense. This is now the most famous site of remembrance to the Holocaust within modern Germany and the territory of the former Third Reich, but it is only one of many. So that's the rather sort of um, lugubrious start of the history chapter. Let's move to the present day and to chapter two, the start of it, which is called Mutti's Warm Embrace. Angela Merkel and the Eastern Legacy. No matter how hard people try, it is not easy to demonize a country which has been led for a decade and a half by a sturdy scientist from a nondescript small town. The rise of Angela Merkel and the role she has played in defining contemporary Germany is one of the more unlikely political stories of the early 21st century. She could not have appeared more ill-suited to the job. A woman, a Protestant, a physicist by training, and a divorcee. 
On the night the Berlin Wall came down, 35-year-old comrade Merkel didn't join her friends in their champagne-fueled celebrations on the unfamiliar streets of the West. She had heard some rumours, and so she phoned her mother, Herlind. Watch out, Mum, there's something up today, she said. It was a Thursday, and she did what she always did on Thursdays. She went to the public sauna with a friend near her two-bedroom flat in Prenzlauerberg. I didn't really understand what I was hearing. Merkel later recalled, I figured it, I figured that if the wall had opened, it was hardly going to close again, so I decided to wait. After her sauna, seeing so many people on the streets, she decided to join them at the nearby crossing point, Bornholmerstrasse. I'll never forget it. It was maybe 10.30 p.m. or 11, or even a little later. I was alone, but I followed the crowds. Suddenly we found ourselves on the western side of Berlin. There she met some random strangers who invited her in. We cracked open some cans of beer. We were just so happy. Then, like many East Germans, she went back again. She had work to do the next morning. In those heady first days, all East Germans were given welcome money by the West German government, a hundred Deutschmarks, instead of spending it on luxury food or drink, or a keepsake or something for a loved one, Merkel focused on the practical. You needed money to go to the toilet or to get a cup of tea. It was November and it was cold. She had long planned to go nach drüben over there, but only once she had reached 60, when pensioners were allowed to leave East Germany for the West, when they had outlived their economic utility. She had worked out her plan for the eventual day. She would go to a police station, exchange her GDR passport for a Western one, then travel to America, where it was her dream to go east, coast to coast, on a road trip. I wanted to see the Rocky Mountains, drive around in a car, and listen to Bruce Springsteen. That was my dream, she later mused. On her way, she would go to West Berlin's Kempinski Hotel and eat oysters with her mum. She never got around to doing that before her mother died, aged 90, in 2019. An entire generation of Germans has known only Mutti, Mummy, as Chancellor. She has embodied Germany's profound longing for stability. In all that time, she has rarely spoken about herself. Even when Time magazine made her Person of the Year in 2015, she declined to be interviewed. She doesn't like talking about her gender or her background. This reticence has become her brand. One former aide told me that Merkel rarely showed strong emotions close up. Not, he insists, because of any coldness, but because of her upbringing. She has been socialised by her life in the GDR system. She was fully aware that people betray their friends. She is rarely disappointed because she expects so little from people. Others who have worked with her say that her interest in culture kept her grounded. Ulrich Wilhelm, government spokesman from 2005 to 10, recalls that on long plane journeys to and from global summits, they would discuss not just political strategy, but also literature and art. Um, and that art bit, um, one of the most controversial bits in the book, is when um, Merkel invited David Cameron to Meseberg, and they began to talk about art. So you might want to ask me about that later. Right, the third and uh, the last bit, which is short, which was um, to Rudiger's point about um, why. What, this is uh, the conclusion to my introduction, if that's not an uh, oxymoron. What do the Germans do better? And what lessons do they actually have to teach? Or rather, have they learned? In posing these questions, I hope to spark a different kind of debate about the country. Not to suggest superiority, but to redress the balance of recent history. Look around your local bookshop in any country, and how many books are there about Germany that are not about the two world wars? There have been some admirable ones in the UK in recent years, but they are few and far between. So why write this book now? Germany is coming out of a sustained period of economic growth and entering a time of heightened uncertainty. My year-long trip and series of interviews have not made me starry-eyed or blind to the country's problems. 
I include them all here. The Germans I interviewed for this book, from politicians and CEOs of multinationals to artists, volunteers helping refugees, old mates and ordinary friends, ordinary folk met at random, all recoiled at the thesis and the title of the book. That's what I said earlier, without a single exception. You cannot say that, they would exclaim with a shriek or awkward laugh. They then embarked on a long list of troubles that the country faces and thinks that it gets wrong. Everywhere they look, Germans feel anxious. They see all that they hold dear being threatened. They see a world in which democracy is openly mocked by populists and strongmen. From Donald Trump to Vladimir Putin, from Turkey's Recep Tayyip Erdogan to Brazil's Bolsonaro. At home, they see the AFD everywhere and mainstream politicians struggling to cope. They, like everyone, see the climate emergency before their eyes. What better time to test the country's resilience than now? Most Germans, let alone foreigners, see only dark times ahead for their country. I passionately disagree. Although, of course, there are many problems. What gives me cause for hope is their self-questioning, their almost morbid restoking of memory. Germans cannot bring themselves to praise their country. This refusal to see good is hardwired. And yet, particularly when compared with the alternatives on offer in Europe and beyond, they have much to be proud of. As the American commentator George Will wrote in early 2019, today's Germany is the best Germany the world has seen. More hubristic countries like my own would be wise to learn from it. Thank you so very much. I think it gives a glimpse of the book, I think, and it, it already contains some, some very substantial observations. But let's, uh, let's talk for a moment about the comparison between Britain and Germany, because this book is, as much as it is about Germany, it's about your own country. And uh, you are coming to a brutal verdict, and I quote, uh, your country is a moribund political system and a delusion, it lives with a delusion of grandeur. I mean, this is, this is the ultimate negative, what you can say about a country. And your gloomy country, uh, sort of your gloomy outlook for your own country, sort of uh, very much contradicts what you say about Germany. It's just the opposite. Foundation of a constitution, institutions, a belief in, in, in self-reflection and so on and so forth. So many of your countrymen, interestingly enough, and you just told us about the high numbers of prints, um, seem to, to, if not like this thesis, at least it goes down and, and they respect it. But some say you're so much over the top, you're sort of uh, 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 bad-mouthing your own country. And um, whereas you are uh, lifting Merkel as a heroine and, and Johnson as a clown. Uh, is that over the top? Is there some truth in it that by the negative description of your own country, you're lifting us up to a height which we sometimes don't see ourselves? I mean, absolutely the right question, really. I mean, it's for others to, to judge. Um, most of the reviews, with one notable exception, have praised the book for being balanced, for not being over the top, um, including um, a pre-endorsement from Theresa May's number two, the deputy, former Deputy Prime Minister, David Liddington, um, which I really regarded as important. Um, as I say in the book, there are, one can, I could quickly, and it will be an incomplete list, um, go through all the areas where I think Germany is in deep trouble. Um, it's been slow to understand the dangers of China, probably the one area where, where Trump has been smart. Um, I have real problems with Germany's Russia policy, having um, spent a lot of time in Russia. I think Merkel has been very strong on sanctions. Nord Stream makes me very cross. Um, there's a lot of problems with that. Overexposure of the economy to exports 
to emerging powers, which did, when it was good, was very good, but has left Germany exposed. Um, a lack of uh, investment in innovation, in entrepreneurialism. Self-employment is still almost seen by people as the thing that people do when they can't find a job, rather than you know, having taken pride in the entrepreneurial spirit of startups. Um, there's a huge amount that, you know, I think the education system is wonderful, but I think the selection process begins at a very early age and puts people into boxes probably too rigidly at too early a stage. There are many other areas that I would criticize Germany for, so this is not a hagiography. There are many things I would praise the UK for. I mean, I've just, two years ago, I stopped representing the UK's creative industries. I set up the body to look after it for five years. And our creativity, our um, uh, entrepreneurialism, our relationship between creativity and tech um, is wonderful. Um, as is so much of our heritage um, and a lot of the beauty of the, of the country. The problem with heritage and thinking about the past is rather than it energizing you for the future, what has happened in our country is that it's paralyzed us. It's paralyzed us from thinking about the future. And this is one of the great juxtapositions for Germany. Because Germany cannot think about the past, or at least the 20th century past, it has no option but to think about the future. Whereas whenever we have a problem, we just think we will sing Rule Britannia and somehow that this will, will, will get us out of, um, out of, out of problems. And it's a combination of using history as, as balm, as, as, as a plaster to paper over present problems and a lack of planning for the future. Let, John, let's stick to a present problem, which is Brexit. I mean, for all of us. We, 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 I think we didn't grasp it in the past, why you did it, now you do it, and, and you do it in a way which sometimes seems to many of us uh, un unpredictable. Uh, unprofessional, and now your prime minister even doesn't want, to, doesn't want to respect the already sort of signed exit treaty. Uh, this very day, uh, all the conservative former prime ministers so, are openly engaged in being in opposition to the prime minister, which never has been in history. So give me your assessment, is there still a chance, I mean, facing this opposition from well-known and respected British people, is there still a chance that the tide will turn and things might change? I don't think it's actually very, this sounds a very strange thing to say, but short term, I don't think it's very important for this reason, that if there is no deal or a pretty superficial, shallow deal, it won't make a lot of difference. It won't make a lot of difference in terms of trade. What does matter are the optics and the damage that this has been done, and the damage has been absolutely cemented by this cavalier approach to international law. I mean, it's not an original point of view. You see it in the British, the German, the American, the French press, that it will make it virtually impossible for the UK ever, or at least in the near future, to cite international law in any dispute or in any sense of moral outrage about another, what another country has done. If Putin wants to go and invade another state, if the Chinese want to clamp down on Taiwan in the way that they've done on Hong Kong, what will not be of any use or interest to anybody is what the Brits say. Because all you need to say is, well, we don't really care about international law. So what matters at the moment, the understanding of it, and I'm, I'm a person of the centre-left, but in all my journalism and in all my work, I have worked very well with Conservative governments, with Cameron, with Osborne. John Major is now quite a good friend of mine. I have great respect for, for the other political tradition, but what we are dealing with now is not the other political tradition. It is a form of anarchic clownery that is, you can, choose your, you can choose your adjective, it is deeply, deeply 
depressing on every on every front. And what would be really interesting is, is what might happen in light of the American elections, because obviously it's massive. Um, uh, effect it will have on, on Germany with the relations that the former American ambassador had and, and the insults that Trump throws at Merkel with, with abandon. Um, and obviously if Trump wins or if Trump tries to somehow snatch victory by another means, not, not impossible, then all bets will be off. But if he loses, then Boris Johnson will have lost his one mentor is one lodestar. Whatever disputes Biden will have with Europe, and he will have many, America will go back into mainstream foreign policy in terms of its behavior. And that will leave the insel even more exposed. And I think the most significant aspect of this declaration of, of disdain for international law has been the response of the Americans. Nancy Pelosi and others, basically in anticipation of a Biden government saying, if this is the way you behave to Ireland, an incredibly strong constituency in the United States, then we're not going to sign a trade deal with you guys. So he shot himself in, in both feet. Um, does he care? I, I think, please don't, I know him well, we work together at Telegraph. Don't underestimate, and I'm sorry to sound crude here, his buffoonery. He is not somebody who would sit in a room like this. He would entertain you brilliantly. He'll have you laughing. He'll have you falling off your chairs with jokes. He would not be able to sustain a coherent intellectual conversation with a single one of you. So far to the British Prime Minister, back to the <laughs> Insel. Um, I mean, what I am astounded about is the change of what we always sort of uh, loved with the British, the common sense, the neck for anecdotes, the narrative, British humor, all that what, what we admired. And you embody it. I saw you with Katie Adler in your discussion on BBC. I mean, this was just two intelligent Brits talking to each other. It was fast, it was not furious, but very good. So where has that gone? I mean, the difference of culture, which you now sort of describe, the difference of culture, the different sort of look at the past and look at the future especially. How come that a nation which we admire so much changed so much to a way which we, here's the former German ambassador to London, I mean, he's, this is certainly a question which Thomas every day puts to himself. No, How no, come? I want to give the answer to that. But later on, <laughs> later on, not yet, but certainly. First, the answer of a real Brit. <laughs> uh, I would rather defer to Thomas, but anyway. Um, I, I, Brexit was not the cause of any problem. Brexit was the manifestation of a deeper problem, um, which, to use all the cliches, was a divided country, a culture war, metropolitan versus non-metropolitan. Um, people of, to quote David Goodhart, people of somewhere, people of nowhere, people of anywhere, uh, people of nowhere. Um, all of that is, is true. What has happened in the UK, and Tony Blair tried a little bit, but it was a tragedy, he didn't try harder, and then he got engulfed with Iraq to modernize the country. Um, there, you know, I mean, going on, on Brexit, of course there was shock and surprise here. There should have been less shock and less surprise. There was an element of wishful thinking here and across Europe. Um, I'm such a miserable person. I took out a three-way bet in 20, at the start of 2016. Brexit, Trump, and Marine Le Pen. I, I lost on the third one, um, thankfully. Um, the, so there was shock and there was surprise. But say, let's just have a, um, a role-play game now. Let's assume Britain voted to leave in June 2016. In any properly functioning country, what would have then happened would have been that the scenario for plan B, because you don't go into any vote if you don't plan for A and B, that the scenario for plan B begins to be rolled out 
a sensible scenario for leaving the European Union, which intellectually is a perfectly uh, sustainable argument, that would have gone into play, maybe a three-month or six-month cross-party royal commission with um, experts in law and finance and trade and this and that and the other, with the, to, led by a former prime minister with a brief to report back to parliament within six months. That then gets debated in parliament, reformed, and then presented, voted on, and after that point, the, article, the country declares Article 6, uh, triggers Article 50, and the formal negotiations begin on the basis of this strong body of work to put the frameworks into a new relationship with Europe and other countries based on not being inside the European Union. It would not have been my first choice, but it would be a perfectly sensible route to go down having called a referendum and that referendum having been agreed to by 52% of the population. But as you all know, nothing of the sort happened. It was chaos from day to day. Um, and to Germans less familiar than yourselves with the UK, that was the greatest shock. Sort of how, you know, which, which is more important? Uh, constitutionally, representative democracy or direct democracy? How would I say? I don't know. Um, which has, takes precedence, the executive or the legislature? Don't know. What role does the courts play? Don't know. And that is what happened in this country. And that, more than the result, has absolutely, its roots lay much earlier. Tony Blair went to war in Iraq in 2003. And I know this for a fact because one of my previous books was about the subject. He did not know when he when when he agreed everything with George Bush in Crawford in April 2002. And you can agree and you can disagree with the decision. That's not the point. He did not know at the time whether Parliament had the right to veto his decision because nobody had told him. Nobody had sort of asked. And found out that there was no provision for Parliament to have a vote, and so there wasn't one. And then Gordon Brown, when he took over, brought in new legislation, in which the next time we go to war, there must be a vote, and they voted against David Cameron sending uh, military forces uh, into Syria. But you see, this make it up as you go along agenda can get you through, and it can be quite amusing, and it certainly plays to a, I think, a happy individualistic side of the, of, of the British psyche. But in this complicated, multi-layered, constitutionally-based world, it's really unfit. <clears throat> Thank you so far to our patient and subject Britain and back to Germany now. We talked about Mutti, and you are in high praise for uh, not only the remembrance culture of Germany, but also for her decision to take close to one million or above a million immigrants into our society and try to integrate them. But at the same time or afterwards, we now see rising anti-Semitism, we see rising xenophobia, uh, we see, we have seen and still see a rising spectrum on the right wing of political parties. So, um, some of my countrymen would say you do overemphasize the positive aspects. You don't, you overlook the negative ones. Or do you see the balance and think this is part of we have to pay for to be an adult country? Well, as I say, uh, as I said earlier, I mean, as, as you have done, uh, if you read the book from start to finish, you, you will see every chapter, and the chapters are thematic. Um, there is a large amount of criticism and concern um, about the, the state of Germany. Um, I think one of the most remarkable things about Merkel has been her crisis management, um, and Germany generally. Um, I, I write in the book that for all the many valid complaints about the decisions taken at the time of and shortly after the vendor I cannot think, and I could list them now, but you know them better than I do, I cannot think of another country that could have done that 
to have absorbed 16 to 17 million people um, from a completely different political system, uh, none of whom had experienced any form of democracy in their lifetimes, having gone from one dictatorship to another different form of dictatorship, not comparable, but, but still a dictatorship. It was an extraordinary achievement. Um, I just, and, and then when you come on to the refugees, we remember the pictures, this caravan of one million people making its way from Greece, from Italy, northwards, being increasingly hounded in the Balkans, uh, and then the horrible scenes in, Ho in Hungary and in Austria. And again, of course mistakes were made, but what was Merkel supposed to do? As she said on TV, what was I, a German, supposed to do? Build camps? It was not, it, she was put in an impossible situation. She was slow to appreciate the danger, that's for sure. And I cannot see what else she could have done. Having decided to do what she did, I think certainly initially the Willkommenskultur was genuine. It wasn't just a piece of ego massaging. It was genuine. It went on for a long time. Now, of course, the rise of the AFD. I mean, there is probably no country in the world where you wouldn't list 10 to 15 percent of the population as on the far right. Our country has it. It's just they were absorbed in the Brexit party, and now they've been absorbed into the extreme of the Conservative party. And the same, uh, another proportion in the far left. Um, any proportional system, as in Germany, it, it just stares at you more clearly in the face, and once it goes over the 5% threshold, it has political representation. Of course it's a danger, and I've spent, not, again, not nearly as much as, as any of you, but a fair amount of time in all the Eastern Lender, and particularly in small towns, and the dangers were there to be seen, and I'm not starry-eyed at all, and they are still ever-present, um, and some of the stuff you hear is, is, is pretty horrible. But I'm cautiously optimistic, particularly with COVID, having seen how mainstream the competence of the centre has sort of shown itself through again now. And while Germany is going to go through another period of, of angst with life after Mutti and who will, which of the CDU, CSU candidates, and then what colour the, the next coalition will be, it will feel very disorientating. Um, but I'm cautiously optimistic, just simply because of the extent to which none of this is taken lightly, that it will be counteracted, but I'm absolutely sure that there will be for many years to come, decades, 10 to 15 percent of people who will vote AFD or something similar. One question about the German psyche. I mean, we, have, we are celebrating this year 30 years of unification. And astonishingly enough, one and a half years ago, together with the AFD as well, with the rise of the AFD, uh, we sort of started, restarted a debate about our own identity, East-West, and certainly we talked about differences more than unity. For you as an outside or sort of outside half, outside half, inside observer, do you see that there is sort of a separation a, a breach which we have to be very careful in watching. Yes, yes and yes, um, but um, I just think there is this, I think this, the absolute saving grace of Germany, which we could do with a lot more of, is seriousness, um, which is not always great, but it's um, the extent to which, um, I, I remember watching, I, can't remember, I think it was Marcus Lantz, and a really, fabulous interview between Jana Hensel and Bernhard Vogel, um, different generations, both one coming from the East, the other with intense experience of the East and West. And I just thought there was a depth, and this was public television, prime time, you know, I don't know what the ratings were, um, but there is a sort of depth about these arguments. When is the complaint legitimate? When does it become Yamabai? You know, um, that, you know, and I do say to GDR friends and people I knew during the, the whole Mauergeschichte who've all, you know, gone off and done different things in their different ways with different views about the past and the present, 
I do remind them that per capita income uh, in the Ostlander is higher than it is in the north of England. Um, the, the remarkable, um, we're talking about leveling up, which is the government's phrase, but Germany has spent the last 30 years leveling up. And of course it's done so sometimes clunkily, sometimes arrogantly, sometimes insensitively, but, and not everything is about economic and GDP, of course it isn't, it's about the sense of self-worth and identity and all of these points. Um, and there is a lack of representation at the top echelons of, um, I mean politics maybe not so bad, but in corporate life, in cultural life, uh, there is still a long way to go. Let's look, uh, for me, two more questions and let's look into the future. You are an ardent observer of German politics for a long, long time. 2021 will be a very decisive year in politics, especially for my country, as far as leadership goes, as far as party leadership goes, as far as the reign of Mutti Zobo, who will sort of replace her. Uh, you talked in your book very, uh, uh, for long stretches, about the, the consensus report you think is one of the strength of her reign as well as Germany. But maybe we will have a more disruptive, less harmonious future. Would that be good? Because many of my countrymen think we have been too status quo oriented, too risk averse. And that's time to change that. So as an outside observer, what do you think is the right equilibrium for Germany? I mean, as, as you all know, had it not been for COVID, the historical reckoning on, on Merkel would have been a little bit different. She would have been respected for her time, but the, the whole conversation in 2019 was, time's up, you know, she's beyond her sell-by date, time for her to go, she's holding Germany back, everything, you know, is slow, langsam aber sicher, kind of taken to an extreme. Um, and it's true, and every positive, has a negative, and every negative has, has the same positive. Um, her extraordinary ability to manage a crisis and this consensus politics has been, has served Germany very well during COVID. It's not just, I mean, there's two, I mean, what's so amusing is that all the way through COVID, and I think this has helped my book, by the way, on the radio and the TV, every question to a British senior politician on, on the BBC or anywhere it was, why can't you do it like the Germans um, on, on COVID? It was everything from PPE to um, provision of beds to track and trace to quarantine. So every single element, whenever Boris Johnson announced it, he would always do this big fanfare and said, we are announcing today a world beating app, which collapsed two days later. <laughs> Um, everything was world beating and it always collapsed, always reversed. And in Germany it was the opposite. I remember her uh, famous now TV uh, appearance of fairly early on in it, in which she simply told people what she knew, what she didn't know, what scientists knew, what they didn't know. She said this is going to be an incredibly difficult time, um, you know, particularly for people who like freedom and whose borders are going to be closed. You're going to be tracked, which for Germans is a particularly difficult situation. Um, all of these things that were frightening, she just said, Take it you, serious. Take it seriously. And sorry, guys, this is unavoidable. And I take no pleasure in doing this. And it's going to be grim. So she managed expectations down. There was no bombast and no fanfare. But alongside that was also this consensus politics in which. Um, there wasn't an attempt by one party to outdo the other party. All the parties were, at least the mainstream parties, were in it together, trying to find a solution. The, uh, the central government with the lender was the same. The politicians with the experts. At every level, an attempt was found, sometimes mistakes were made, to find consensus and to find the most effective rather than to play politics. And that has stood Germany well. Now, for the future, does Germany need more of a lift off? Why was it, you know, why was it so slow? Uh, why is it so slow to embrace technology? Uh, even you know, its 
properly world-beating car industry was nowhere to be seen at the beginning on electrification, on autom autonomous vehicles. You know, corporate Germany fell asleep somewhere along, along the way, um, and it needed a kick. I, I just work from the assumption that with a little bit more impetus, and yes, a new leader will want to be, depending on who it is and what the coalition will be, will, will want to inject a bit more radicalism into this country, but that would be no bad thing. John, last question for me is that you strive for several times the threat from the outside. You mentioned China, you mentioned Russia, you mentioned author authoritarianism, and uh, the question is liberal democracies, and Germany is sort of a role model for stability, for respecting institutions, and, uh, and sort of living with a, a, a active dialogue amongst the citizens. Can this, this role model not only succeed, but only triumph over the others in the long run? What's your outlook? I mean, we are sometimes frightened about models like China, which seem to have a certain influence on the mindsets of our people here as well. The, my new German publishers, Wilbold, said, um, we want for your German edition, not just to tell Germans um, why they're doing it better, but we need to introduce angst and jeopardy, because <laughs> that will serve the Germans. Sells. That sells, 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 sells better well. in Germany. <laughs> Don't make people complacent. And it's true. But there's no shortage of, I, I just said to them, yeah, but if you read it, you'll see there's no shortage of angst and jeopardy in the book. Um, and it does largely go back to what happens in the American elections. Um, if Trump wins term two, all bets are off for everybody on everything. It, it will be the most dangerous time I, in my lifetime, in all of our lifetimes. Uh, even if he doesn't, the, the increasing attractiveness of 21st century authoritarianism, which is so different to 20th century dictatorship, so much more sophisticated, um, is increasing. And this is the great jeopardy for Germany, and I talk about it a lot in my foreign policy chapter, and it goes way beyond the correct American and, and NATO demand for Germany on 2%, which has become a bit of a sort of shibboleth. Um, and it, actually the demand of Germany is much greater than 2%. It is actually to become a leader of Western democracy to defend. Occasionally, that's going to mean some horrible decisions, military decisions, in which there's no reason to invoke Auschwitz, as Joschka Fischer did in the 90s, um, to get Germany to fall behind um, uh, military action in Kosovo. Germany cannot look to its past to get the, its people over the line on these difficult areas in the future. It is right out there. It is absolutely, and the more the UK retreats, the more the US retreats, which it will continue to do even if it becomes more of a mainstream state again, it will retreat more from Europe. That's continuing. The more, the bigger the role there will be on Germany and on France and on Europe in general to stand up and be counted. And that is going to have to mean a very different approach, in my view, to China, to Russia, and to other forthcoming threats. So with that call of action now, it's on you to ask questions. Please identify yourself, but if you're asking a question, make it short so that uh, a lot of us can have the chance to pose question to John. Or just tell me my thesis is rubbish, that's fine too, that's quicker. No, 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 no. <laughs> it is not. Come on, who is first? Okay, come on. Thomas. And, and for your uh, tactful, slight criticisms on certain uh, things German. Um, what I asked myself, without having read the book, but uh, uh, we know each other, we talked a lot about these issues in the past. Um, just imagine if you had written a book called Why Do the Austrians It Better? <laughs> or Why Do the Tibetans Do It Better? Because each and every country has a different history, certain things they do better, other things left well, and I don't think it would have been a great success. Or you could have also, let's say, published the book not in, in Britain, but in Brazil. For the Brazilian book market, why do the Germans do it better? And I don't think you, you would have gotten much more than a truck. So what I'm aiming at is, 
there is a certain dialectic relationship between Britain and Germany, and why is there this frisson? And, and having lived in Britain and discussed these issues, as you know, for many, many years, um, there is, of course, something in the general um, psychology in Britain. Um, I would just say one or two remarks. One is, for instance, for Britain, or for the normal Brit, it was always important to, to remember the moment when Britain stood alone against an overpowering enemy and by mustering British virtues, overcome that enemy. So for Britain's self-esteem, for Britain's identity, you needed always the other. And Germany presented itself as the other. Now you can say, this might have been true for the first couple of years after the war. Why now, 70 years later? But the fact that this book called, caused such a stir, a certain frisson, shows that that is still there, still lingering on. And I wonder, I wonder how we cope with this underlying problem. Well, you could actually, British problem. You could actually put it the other way, I mean, without being sort of self-referencing too much, just say one more thing about the book and its reception. I was expecting an absolute hammering for this book. That has not happened. Rather the reverse. It's been almost completely blanket positive and praising, with two exceptions. The Daily Telegraph, my former newspaper, um, called it Brexit revenge porn. <laughs> Um, which um, I, I still was looking for the porn. Which, <laughs> which I so like. We're going to put on the cover of the of the, of the next edition. Um, but interestingly, then another commentator came out a week later with a very different uh, take on the book. And I know him, and I said to him, "Was that zufällig?" And he said, "No, my editors were a bit embarrassed by the by the review." I wish I even even the Telegraph I thought that was interesting. And there was another one in the Times Literary Review um, by Daniel Johnson, who used to be a correspondent here, known to you, um, who starts off saying, "I really hated this book because of its title," and then he goes on to say, "But I liked everything else about it." <laughs> and then I wrote to him just a funny note saying, "So would you prefer it if I had said why the Germans?" do it mostly better much of the time. You know, I don't think the book would have sold so well. Um, you know, and um, so he, he, he took the point. But no, to your point, Thomas, I think, I mean, sadly, I think what's happened, I, I, I think it is, it is almost completely unacceptable now in Britain to be anti-German. And it has been for some time. Uh, there was one Brexiting, one of the many crazies called Marc Francois, who started doing something about the Huns and this and that during the, the stuff a year or two ago. And he was absolutely jumped on by his party. And so I think anti germanness is not, it's basically, I mean, you, you'll hear it in the pub, but, but in, in public life, you don't hear anymore. You heard it absolutely up to about the 80s and after. Anti Frenchness, similarly. But what's happened is, is all morphed into this big, horrible enemy, otherwise known as Europe, right? I and mean, that's all that's happened. And, and, you know, this terrible enemy that is the European Union that will eat our babies for breakfast and all this sort of thing. Um, you know, that is basically, it's just a transposing of this, of this absurd, and it only belongs to a certain category of the population. And it's all demographic, it's all older. It's, you know, to be optimistic, you just simply say these people, you know, are not going to be around forever, and there is no indication that they're being replaced. You know that that um, scepticism and hostility is moving up the agenda as people in their twenties go into thirties and thirties go into forties. There's no evidence of that. So taking a long game, looking 10, 15, 20 years ahead, you know, Britain might eventually become a more open society. But there's many things 
moving against it, for example, there's almost no teaching of foreign languages. Now, German has almost ceased to exist in schools. French, not much. It's no longer obligatory to learn a language in school, which is, you know, my, when, in my day, we had to learn two. Um, and, and those sorts of things, that's a counterpoint. But I do think it is becoming a, not necessarily more pro-European, but a more internationalist, a more ease with the world society, but it will take time to play through. Jan Rosenberg is next, yeah. Um, as I am a, a personally a fan of Angela Merkel, it, it, I, I really appreciate what you, it sounds very good to me, it goes down very well, um, but could it could have been just a, a coincidence that we have such a great leader from my point of view in the last 20 years? Um, what, when, you, when you're writing about the German people, do you see that many of those qualities of Angela Merkel are also reflected in the German people? Do you see a, um, a, a, a connection there? Um, or, do you, or would you say we just had lots of luck you know, with a leader like that, and maybe when she's gone, it's all over? Well, at the risk of sounding glib, um, that old saying, you get the politicians you deserve. Um, look at my country. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, I mean, just back on, on Johnson, his opinion poll ratings are down, but they're not down very much. So he is still, even though he has presided over, over more than 40,000 deaths, even though the exam system collapsed, even though he, uh, the health system is collapsing, even though internationally we're a laughing stock, his opinion poll ratings are not down that much and quite normal for a politician in their first year in government. So, um, you, you, you know, and then the other phrase is the electorate is, is, is never wrong. It normally chooses, and whether it's a coalition or whatever, the result normally reflects the thinking of the time. Germany, I mean, you know German politics, all of you, a hundred times better than me, so I, I should just be careful, but I mean, after Schroeder and the Hartz reforms, there was a yearning for um, greater stability. She provided that stability, certainly at the beginning. Um, and there was a great radicalism, her environmental radicalism at the beginning, which then disappeared. I mean, it's come back a tiny bit. There was a sort of um, halcyon moment for her, and then it began to, to go quiet again. And, and COVID has given her this, this one final uplift that will preserve her um, uh, very highly. But if you go back over all the German post-war chancellors, one can agree and one can disagree, and, and I'm absolutely furious with, I, I, the one area of German life that I find most troubling is a refusal to go after m malfeasance, go after bad, bad practice. I cannot understand how Schroeder was allowed to negotiate his contracts with the Kremlin while he was still in office. I still find that just, as Merkel would say, unfed cyber. I, I just cannot get my head around it. And I think our more crazy, but maybe more disrespectful press would, I just can't imagine that, that happening. And, and, and I see that sometimes with some of the corporate corruption, with the foul baby emission scandal, everything else. There is a sort of, def not a deference to authority, but there is a sort of politeness in the public realm that sometimes goes too far, and it's sometimes required to take the gloves off yes. and to really throw dirt at people who do bad things. And I think Germany in some ways is a little bit too responsible and too polite um, in that regard. I think she was lucky on the economy. She inherited um, a strong economy, and that has sustained. Uh, the Schwarzen Null, everybody was worrying about that, now that's been blown apart. So it's a different um, situation for the new leader. But um, it's not a hagiography of her, but I just think there, she and, you know, there's an interesting sort of rehabilitation about Helmut Kohl. Um, you know, uh, one go back, obviously Billy Pant, Helmut Schmidt, there's been a quality of leadership, whether you're on their side or the other side, that is, and, and a sort of stability that I think is quite impressive. Jane Martins, please. 
My name is Jane Marks. Thank you very much indeed, John. It was delightful to listen to you. I've been in Germany for 30 years, and just listening to you this evening, I was thinking, what am I to tell my 84-year-old mother who's decided to leave London and move to Berlin and before the end of December? Uh, and I was thinking about the things I've learned living here over 30 years, 25 of which I've been in Berlin. What's your view? I haven't read your book yet. I've only just bought it. But what's your view about German perfectionism? Because if I think about the one single thing that makes Germany and Britain very different from each other, the Brits are satisfied with 80%. They're happy they've got that much done and, and have a different attitude to the remaining 20. And I think it's almost a fatal flaw, like in a Shakespearean tragedy in Germany, that the perfectionism that makes the country so great in areas like car manufacturing, technology, and so forth, also robs them of their genuine joy and happiness about having achieved something, because the last 5% isn't as perfect as they'd like to have it. Is that a view that you share, or perhaps something you could yeah. build into your next book? I think it's, oh, again, you've had much more experience than I do. I would um, uh, really sort of beginning it, and there's various anecdotes in the book, and um, I must say, being a very urban and hopefully a vain Londoner, living in Bonn, I did find a challenge. Um, and um, I love the way Germany is so regionalized. Not everything is focused on this one big monolithic city, which is obviously the case in Britain and in France, and in a lot of other countries, two big cities, but still a huge concentration. And Germany is so much more you know, diverse and diffuse, and so much economic activity taking place in so many places. But I find the yeah, perfectionism can become nitpicking. And one of my choice anecdotes, well, I, mean, I did the usual one about being fined at four o'clock in the morning for crossing over the water ampel in um, Bonn. And I said to the policeman, you will not see another car for three hours. <laughs> and he wanted to find me more for um, you know, being, being difficult with me. And I said, oh God, it really, you know, it's, 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 you know, the law is the law. Uh, and the other one, which was, um, you know, which you get all the sort of care bomber stuff, particularly in, in, and, um, in Bonn, I had a, a beautifully embossed envelope uh, with lovely writing, lots of care and attention in, in, inside, you know, sehr geehrter Nachbar, um, would you please clean your car because it's bringing down the reputation of our street? <laughs> Um, and, um, you know, and, and that's a polite way. And that's a polite way. No, it was, it was, it was, no, it was effortlessly polite. It was so <laughs> nicely written. No, 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 that was the thing about it. It was absolutely charming. And then obviously gone to the, to the stationery shop to buy a particularly nice envelope. And um, no, it was, everything was polite about it, except it enraged me. Um, you know, in other words, mind your own business. But, you know, if you look at my lovely street, I, I'm very fortunate, I live in a lovely house in Bloomsbury, etc. of London, there's just rubbish everywhere. And, you know, and that's just on a normal day. So, in a way, again, the positive, the flip, either side of sort of going too far in terms of or normal sign and um, a more sort of... Yeah, let's say fair. Um, you know, the perfect society. Will have a wonderful mixture of, mixture of in just perfect proportions of both, but um, I'm not sure we found that. Klaus Wittmann, please. Klaus. Yeah. Um, what you said about atonement, uh, remembrance culture, and so on, makes me curious whether the book also deals with a phenomenon which Gauck described, uh, described in his famous speech, saying, uh, "French friends <coughs> often ask me, don't you use the past?" in order to avoid today's problems and taking responsibility. And in connection with that, the fact that Putin uh, uh, manages so well with many Germans to depict him and Russia as a victim, does it also have to do with the Nazi past or more with the anti-Americanism in Germany? Uh, two, um, I mean, really, really, um, Good questions. I do quote. The, you're talking about the one at the Munich Security Conference. Yeah, I, I quote that, and I and, and my foreign policy chapter is yeah. is all based around the responsibility. taking responsibility agenda, which much more widely than the, than the two percent um, agenda. Um, 
I was reading, after I wrote the book actually, I read the second volume of Volker Ulrich's 1,000 page biography of Hitler. Uh, his first volume, which takes you to 1939, is incredible. Mm -hmm. And his second volume, for both 1,000 pages, um, slightly less so, but I still think was, was, was amazing too. And as a Brit, or as, as an American probably, it's easy with all the Cold War history that followed to fail to understand um, the Eastern Front and how he describes it. The sheer viciousness, the, the genocide, the ethnic cleansing, um, you know, when you think of that in German context, you just think of the Holocaust. And then you think of the military campaign. There was a sort of, at the risk of sounding simplistic, a halfway house between calculated murder and, um, and military invasion. And that was the Eastern Front. And so... Annihilation. Annihilation, absolutely. And racial, racial inspired by, by racial superiority. Um, and we forget that. I mean, in Britain, we think we won the war and everybody just helped. Um, you know, we have no real sense of, you know, what would have happened if the Americans hadn't stepped in after Pearl Harbor, let alone, you know, what the Russians did. Um, and so I, I think we in the Anglo Saxon world slightly fail to understand. I'm trying to be generous because I feel very strongly about Russia and Putin. We fail to understand the sense of German increased guilt towards Russia that is greater than, than perhaps towards uh, the, the Western states. Or at least you can't really compare, but it is extremely significant. And there's that sense of atonement continues. And, but I, I just go back, you know, I mean, I lived in Moscow twice, but the second time was all during the optimistic period of the early mid. 90s, and you know, you could be a Russland fest there, but you cannot be, in my view, and carry any credibility being a Putin fest there. They're completely different um, mindsets, and I, you know, I think Merkel was incredibly brave after Crimea, Eastern Ukraine, and the Malaysian airliner to get the EU to, to force through sanctions and then to step them up. Um, it'd be interesting to see what she does with regard to Navalny now uh, with Europe, and I hope it will be very, very tough. But uh, and I go at some length, and I did a report for Rusi, the defence think tank, as well about Russian and Chinese infiltration of Germany, which came out about a month or two ago. The extent of the media manipulation by RT Deutschland and by others, and particularly in Eastern Ender, is, is very, very strong, and that's something. Um, people like Wurtgen and, and others are absolutely right on, in my view. And interesting, I'm always fascinated by the Greens here and how tough the Greens are on, on, on Russia as well, which I've never quite got to the bottom of, but maybe you can explain. There's two more questions, one in the back and then one here. Please, go on. Please. My name is uh, Alan Winter. <clears throat> Thank you very much for um, opening, just in your book, that question. It's been a question that's been um, <clears throat> preoccupying me I lived in New York City for many years, and it was kind of this uh, phenomenon that I noticed <coughs> uh, trying to adjust. Uh, you can take out um, uh, you know, the German out of Germany, but you can't take out the German out of the out of Germany. So, uh, but I, the question I have to you is: I can't help, um, you know, having watched the, um, the Brexit debates in the British Parliament, um, to sort of be, um, shall I say? Be impressed uh, in a negative way by <clears throat> the sort of self-referential tone in debates that seems to put a particular emphasis on being witty um, and entertaining at the expense of being serious and really being confronted with serious <coughs> issues and being so taken by the intelligence of uh, doing a debate uh, uh, Maybe it comes from elite school culture of really getting off on, on, on being a better um, debating person. And it seemed so almost uh, adolescent 
just the lack of, uh, of seriousness in it. I, 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 I'm wondering whether this is, um, is this questioned in Britain too, where people say these guys are just full of themselves, they're debating peacocks, um, and, and really not taking their task seriously? I mean, I, in a way, I'm shocked yeah. at that. Um, well, I would only say don't be. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I, I did an interview with Spiegel and, and uh, Jörg Schindler, the London correspondent, said, so uh, if you describe Germany as grown up, what one word would you describe Britain? And I said infantile. Um, and that comes from that. I, I quoted in my book uh, a Berlin friend of mine who just said to me, as a, you know, just as a joke, I think we were in a pub in, in Berlin, and. Um, she said, oh, I've given up my Netflix subscription because I get all the entertainment I need watching the British Parliament. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I mean, there are upsides. You, when you have great debates of global importance, some of the big war debates, you know, um, around Iraq or whatever, I mean, there are, you know, it, it is stirring. And there aren't that many of them, but the two or three dozen politicians from all the parties who really know their stuff are impressive to hear. And there isn't really the forum here. Everything is done in the Ausschüsse and there's, there's no, um, there is no place. Again, the positive negative. If Germany could have 10% of that, just the great moments of parliamentary life, don't have to be very often, maybe six or 10 a year, in which the big issues of the moment are, are, are discussed uh, I think that would uh, connect politicians more closely um, with with their peoples rather than <clears throat> one could be, you know, competence is, 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 is fabulous and Merkel has shown it hugely. Um, but when competence leads to excessive technocracy, that is when, you know, and, and either a, an inability to or a failure to or a lack of awareness of the need to explain yourself um, to, politi uh, to, to the public, that's when divisions happen. But no, I mean, what we have is just a bunch of overgrown schoolboys, um, you know, throwing, you know, throwing words at each other, and it's, uh, it is what it is. Last question goes there, please. Jeremy Miller, hi, Jack. Chris Payne, thank you for the time. Thank you for the discussion and the book. I did actually download it and read it this week. It was wonderful by the paper format. Uh, but I had two questions for you. Well, one is in connection with Nord Stream and Nord Stream 2. I sense some, some strong skepticism from your side in connection with this project. And I was curious, you say, well, you know, you say in the book that Germany is a densely populated but energy poor country, with the exception of coal. And having gone away from coal and now going away from nuclear power, it, what do you think Germany should do in order to secure its, so the energy security, right? Nord Stream 2 seems to be designed to solve that problem. And if I can sneak another question in, something you said up here kind of caught my attention, is that Germany needs to step up and become kind of the defender, the standard bearer of Western democracy. I was curious, and I think the sense came through the book as well, I was curious if you thought that role should go to Germany as opposed to the EU more broadly, or do you see Germany sort of be acting unilaterally beyond the EU in order to step up and defend democracy? Yeah, well, first of all, on the first half of your question, you should get a special hero's medal because I've done now all of them digitally, but and, and also interviews um, just in the last three weeks about 20 or 30, and you're the first person to ask me about environmental and energy, um, which is one quite a sizable chapter in the book, but hasn't caught the, the, the imagination of people who, who read it. Um, but they are, of course, they're connected with Nord Stream, the sense of German vulnerability in terms of energy supply and I talk about it at greater length um, in the book. Um, I mean, there's, there's so many things to say. I mean, the, the, the stranglehold, another big negative in Germany is the stranglehold the auto lobby has on politicians, um, which not only led them into complacency and, and a loss of market share globally in terms of technological change and led them into scandal and abuse of power, but very rarely punished seriously um, and concertedly by regulators. There's a real issue in this country as well, it seems to be in terms of reg regulators. I mean, the Wirecard 
Um, I mean, Lionel Barber, who has just stepped down as being editor of the FT, <coughs> really led, um, <coughs> he's actually reviewed the book for this week's Spectator, and um, he thinks I'm over generous to Germany when it comes to economic and corporate regulation. I would have had and I think he's probably right, and I think that's a legitimate um, criticism. But I think Nord Stream is connected with this sense of energy vulnerability. I also think it is, well, I mean, it stems from Schroeder's time. And um, I quote various um, Eastern European leaders talking of Schroeder basically, basically becoming the PR arm of the Kremlin. And, um, I think this would be a wonderful opportunity now, in adversity, with what happened to Alexei Navalny, just to stop it. And I know the arguments, and I've had the arguments between the Germany cannot stop it. These are private companies. I always say, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and if they wanted to, they could. Um, and the argument that it would make Russia as plugged into Europe as Europe is plugged into Russia I personally don't think is a sustainable argument. I'll, I'll just leave it politely as that. Um, as regards Germany or the EU, I mean, yeah, that's I mean, one of the great tragedies of Brexit is that Germany and Britain saw more eye to eye in EU defence, security, and usually economic matters than any two other countries did. Possibly throw in the Netherlands as well. Um, Germany is much more exposed in the EU without without the UK and the EU will look different too. Um, and one could talk forever about the future of the EU and, and how it will evolve. Certainly I don't think any country is going to leave in a hurry um, after what they've seen. But it, it will change. Um, I think this goes back to this exhortation to Germany to step up that yes, so much needs to be done through EU auspices and the sanctions against Russia were so much more significant coming, and I'm not just using that example, there are many examples, when uh, they've been done by 27, then 8, 28 countries, uh, not only the power of them, but also the sense of cohesion around them. So Germany must continue to do things through the EU, but it should not see the EU as its get out of responsibility clause. There will be times when Germany has to do things because it's Germany, not because the, it's got all 27 countries to agree them. And that will be a really interesting moment. Thank you very much. At the end of the day, it's about leadership. And thank you very much for your lead into tonight and having you with us. It was a very interesting, very insightful evening. Thank you, John. <laughs>